it? No. It's herding cats, coordination of assessment and standards. I'm kidding. I just have a lot of cats in my PowerPoint. Uh, we're going to be hearing from uh, Victoria Van Zandt doing the ABA assessment mandates and academic freedom. Uh, Sandra Simpson, avoiding assessment fatigue. I'm really interested in hearing about that. And we're going to start off with this uh, from Jennifer Spring. Uh, suppose the class began the day the case walked in the door. walked in the door. I mean, imagine this. It's the first day of the first semester of the first year. The professor announces that the class has a new client, and she's coming in to meet for an initial consultation in a couple of weeks. And we have to get prepared for that. OK, so that's our setting. Let's talk about meeting this client. You know, meet Lee Taylor. She's the woman. Oh, wait, sorry, no, uh, that's not Lee. Uh, that's an advertisement from Southern Living Magazine for the fictional uh, blockbuster diet drug by prescription, Aspire. Uh, Lee is a 40-something mother of two who took Aspire, she was prescribed it by her doctor, so that she could lose that you know, extra 20 pounds before her daughter's wedding. The good news is Lee lost the weight. But she didn't attend the wedding. She was recovering from a heart attack brought about by a damaged mitral valve in her heart. A disturbing New England Journal of Medicine article um, showed pictures of a number of other Aspire patients and their hearts that also had the exact same type of damage as Lee. Wow. That said, the label for Aspire, the patient medication guide, the package insert, none of them mentioned that a spire might cause heart valve damage. So the students start the course with a high level overview of torts, especially including, oddly, product liability torts. They then move on to personal jurisdiction. In that time period, they are assigned to work in four member law firms. Some of those law firms are going to represent Lee Taylor and her husband. Others will represent some of the defendants that will be identified. These plaintiffs' firms interview Lee and uh, uh, begin drafting a complaint. The defendants' firms meet with their potential clients, and they prepare a joint defense agreement. Identifying defendants takes a little effort on uh, both sets of firm sides. Um, the actual manufacturer of Aspire is a company called Kimberly Robb Incorporated. But Aspire is, well, it's a one ingredient product. It's this drug called Optimicin in a capsule. And Optimicin is manufactured and formulated by a sort of a shadowy group of pharmaceutical companies in, uh, called the Andorran Pharmaceutical Group, located in the Principality of Andorra, which is sandwiched sandwich between uh, France and Spain. Kimberly Robb even know anything about Optimicin in particular when it uh, put it in its product? What about Lee's doctor? Did she, did she know it might be uh, damaging to Lee's heart? What about Lee's family pharmacist? And then students start to wonder as they've been reading their cases and begin working up the case, uh, is it possible that uh, you, know, you can actually sue a pharmacist for filling a prescription when the pharmacist maybe knew that the drug was dangerous when a physician actually prescribed the drug? How do you get information on whether a spire actually causes heart valve damage and whether someone knew about that? What techniques can you use? And how much information do you need? Uh, is it possible for Kimberly Robb essentially to hide behind the fact that a doctor prescribed this drug if, they, if the company knew that the drug was damaging? Especially since, of course, they were out there doing advertising in Southern Living Magazine, right? Straight to consumers. And how do you get jurisdiction in an American court over a bunch of companies from a place that I bet a lot of you never heard of? Okay. Well, welcome to introdu Introduction to Civil Litigation, which is a first year 10 credit full year course that in an innovative way integrates torts and civil procedure as well as this litigation simulation 
And a lot of the instruction in the course is anchored in that si simulation, Taylor versus Andorran Pharmaceutical Laboratories, okay? Um, the thing about the course that is uh, important for our perspective is that that list of items of various documents and activities that students would have done that I sort of blasted out on a, a couple of slides ago, those are all formative assessments. And they all occurred in an organized way, linked to actual doctrinal teaching in the classroom, a set of special workshops, and other more individualized instruction. They linked right into the course itself. And that's what makes that kind of course exciting. Now, I think these kinds of things may turn out to be in the 10 to 20 year future of, uh, in the 10 to 20 year future of our first year courses and formative assessment. They may be where we are going. And it may be interesting for us to think about, well, what might that mean, okay? In the paper itself, there are really going to be two theses. One is that, uh, of course, this creates a very professionally authentic experience, even in the first year, where frequently it isn't. You can read the paper to find out all about that, okay? I want to talk about the part that is the more pedagogically powerful aspect of anchoring so much instruction into a series of what are, in fact, linked formative assessments. Uh, you know, we've seen standard uh, 314 now multiple times. School shall utilize both formative and summative assessment. And if there's one thing that you take from this session, I'd like it to be this. Of course, that looks like the what? Formative assessment standard, right? And you'd think, well, that's a standard about assessment. I don't think so. Law schools have always been required to do assessments by the ABA, okay, but summative ones. In fact, the formative assessment standard is really a standard about teaching. And here's why. Obviously, formative assessment helps us as professors, okay, to improve our courses and to link our teaching to what's actually going on, sometimes very much in real time in the classroom. But what it also does is it gives students an opportunity to practice and learn in the process of doing things. That's a purpose of formative assessment also. And we've heard reference to this, but let me be clear. It also allows students to figure out, am I doing well or not? Or more importantly, am I learning what I need to learn? And sort of what might I have to do to fix that? When they see feedback from professors, that's one of the, that kind of information is important to students for that self-regulated learning function. But there's another part of uh, learning that we can sometimes forget about, but I've heard so many people talk about developing professional identity, and I think that this is an important thing as well. Students have to learn what are the standards in this profession for doing things. We have types of writing, briefs, we draft all kinds of documents, and there are profession-specific ways of doing that and standards for what makes that good and not good. And over time, students need to learn those things because for one thing, in practice, they will not get feedback from professors. They'll get feedback in a much harsher kind of way, and they have to be able to learn to evaluate their own work. Okay, so this is really a standard about teaching. And we probably ought to think of it at least to some extent in that way. Now, what's the teaching? These are the various assessments that uh, were in that kind of list that I sort of threw up on the other slide while I was talking about the litigation and the kinds of questions that students would be asking themselves in the early parts of the simulation. And they're in order. The course is two semesters long, so this is the first semester. And this is the second semester. And before we get too excited about um, assessment fatigue, although I think we should, okay, these were five credit courses in each semester, okay, so a total of 10 credits. That's a massive amount of sort of student and professor investment in time. These are actually linked together, okay? This first set in red here are really the writing assessments where students produce significant documents not nearly as significant in size and scope as, say, in a legal writing class where you would write some kind of major brief. Not that. But maybe before they were actually taught to do that in a legal writing class. Okay, so that becomes a big hurdle. And the assessments are linked to this extent. For example, in the first semester, this is a one-issue 
assessment. There's either personal jurisdiction or there's not, and there may be multiple arguments, but that's that. In this assessment, if you're remembering back to your civil procedure, you know that a motion to remand is very frequently based on whether it's even viable to think in terms of a cause of action existing substantively or not. And so to determine whether uh, a case should be remanded and to use that sort of procedural content, you have to go to the substantive question of, in that particular case, does, is there even a cause of action against a pharmacist for a failure to warn of dangers in a prescribed drug? Okay. Then, once you've determined that there we are, and this is the only defendant who is a citizen of the same state as the plaintiff, okay? <laughs> then we determine, is there subject matter jurisdiction? Should the case be uh, remanded or not? All right, so that's sort of a two-part assessment. So this is a step one and a step two, but they bring sort of similar types of thinking and structuring of problems, okay? Working together. In the second section, they're very divided, but they're actually linked as well. The first is one of the few individual assign truly individual assessments, where the entire product is by one student. And that assessment is to write about what is the law of causation in these types of cases, provide several cases to students, and they sort of synthesize that law in a brief memorandum, all right, objective memo. Ultimately, the motion for summary judgment has all of its different little parts that you know, play in, but it's all ultimately about, did this drug cause this woman's, or frankly, anyone's heart valve damage? Key, causation, same issue, repeat it again. And that's important because what um, we read about in the literature is the importance of linking assessment so that, you know, if you write a, uh, an answer, you get some feedback back, well, what do you do with that? Does that lead anywhere? And in both cases, there are significant aspects that do, in fact, lead somewhere. Okay. Second is, these are sort of our drafting assignments. And partly, of course, these things are fun. They're interesting to students because you've never seen anything like this before. And so that's kind of fun, and they aren't really graded. But what they are is an opportunity for students to apply law to fact over and over again. Rule 26F states specific things that has to go into that report. And they have to be there. And in practice, you see all these kinds of rules from time to time. They're very difficult to actually apply, and you do have to learn how to do that. This becomes the process of doing those and drafting these activities. So it's actually a very important practice, but in a slightly different setting than, say, an exam of applying law to fact. And we did have exams in this course, OK? So we did have those summative assessments as well. But this is a different context for practice. The feedback loops that I think uh, Professor Coker was talking about a little bit in her presentation are very important to this process. Um, and it was interesting to me because one of the ways that you can link assessments is to have a student redo an assignment, which is effectively what you did. The other way is to have the feedback be very meaningful to a next assignment. This is sort of what a feedback loop is. Through your teaching in the traditional classroom, in our Top Gun school uh, workshops, in individual sessions, you're providing guidance to the student on how to do what has to be done, okay? The substantive law and the processes and things like that. Then in the literature, the student does, does what is called giving a performance. That's say writing the memorandum in support of the motion to dismiss for lack of personal jurisdiction. And there's many times when feedback may be given. It occurs before the assignment is turned in, when the group, the law firm, meets with the professor in the office. And the professor, with some trepidation, says how it's going, because if only one person's working on it, it's a big disaster and you have problems. But in fact, what you are doing is teaching at that time and answering questions and helping to form the process in which they are working on the project. And frankly, answering substantive questions, too. But also, they get feedback from each other. This is sort of the peer feedback bit. When you are putting together a document together and you're arguing about whether arguments belong in that document, I mean, that's sort of the quintessential fee peer feedback. We also had teaching assistants who were allowed to be involved with these projects. I think, in fact, they weren't very much, though they played other roles. Uh, 
And finally, the other type of uh, feedback is, of course, what the professor gives, sometimes copiously in writing after the assignment is turned in. Key, students need to reflect on that feedback. It's really important for that feedback to be carried through to something later, for students to experience the difference between what I did and what my aspirations really should be based on the feedback I received. That's why it's important to have the new performance, either the repeat of what was done, although in our particular case with a fast-moving course, what it ultimately ends up being is a new assignment that is linked so that some of the feedback is clearly relevant to the next assignment. Uh, but that's also why things like multiple activities is, are important. You see studies showing so six <coughs> activities, eight activities is useful for, say, a you know, year-long course or something like that. And if we're doing it in law school where professional preparation is also really important, it ought to be authentic. So it should be in a simulation. Maybe we get away from just assigning problem sets and things like that. And over time, we may see the benefit of moving in that direction to comply with multiple standards at a time. Okay? All I can say is this. There are all kinds of uh, circumstances in which uh, assessment supports learning. And if we think about those, dividing up the time during the term, focusing student effort at different points, providing many opportunities for feedback of the right type, including some that is very real time. I think it's apparent that a practice-based simulation in even a doctrinal course can be a very appropriate way of doing so. Thank you. across the curriculum, which helps to avoid assessment fatigue. And it's really the view from the associate dean's desk. So I'll have to take off my co-director hat, put on my associate dean hat, and I, I liken it to, I, I think it was uh, Renee who said that giving a little piece of your personal life helps you to connect. I do it all the time in the classroom. I didn't actually talk about my kids or my husband or something. So and when my daughter was in fourth grade, she said I was going to go to a parent's thing, you know, it was like a Halloween party at school or something. She goes, God, Mom, you're not going to show up suited up, are you? And I said, well, what does that mean? Well, all the other moms don't come in a suit. And I said, well, I'm not going to go home and change in order to uh, go to the mom's, you know, what, you know, the parents' day. And uh, so I said, and in the, in the end, you're going to thank me. And uh, so now she's going off to college, and indeed, she understands working and why it's important for me and all of those things. That was supposed to be a funnier story, but somehow there's <laughs> um, Anyway, I'm taking, I'm, I'm changing hats. That was the point of that story. So I'm going to move on because uh, you guys didn't like that story. Okay, so um, when Standard 314 came out, um, like I said, as, a, as the co-director of the institute, we looked at formative assessment and I write in formative assessment. Um, but it got me to thinking whether multiple formative assessments that happen at the same time in the semester is actually less helpful and, and actually harmful to students. And um, so I wanted to know if it negatively impacted student learning. And I started to do the research, and there's very little research on it. There seems to be an assumption that formative assessment is good, it's helpful, and I think it is. Um, but I, it got me to thinking, wow, does it help if there's a lot of it or too much of it? And in answering that question, I looked at these three questions. Um, does formative assessment generally have a beneficial impact on students? That was the first thing I looked at. And if so, can student learning and achieving be negatively impacted if there's too many assessments happening at the same time? And if so, how can we avoid that for both the professor, that fatigue, and for the students? And, uh, and, and the main question here is, do we help students and are we helping students learn? 
And I gotta tell you, I, I don't know, this might be the first conference I've ever done where there's actually students in the room. So it got to me, during the first one, I thought, man, that might have been a little bit uncomfortable. We were talking about millennials, and you're like, I don't think that's me. Or, whatever you were thinking, I'm not sure. But let me just tell you that I think it's really important that you're in the room. And I'm thankful that you're in the room. Because when I was in law school, I can tell you, I didn't think that professors ever thought about me. <laughs> now I went to law school in the dark ages, so I, uh, I'm up on my 30-year class reunion coming up in, in this summer, and, and I'm pretty sure they didn't <laughs> care. <laughs> Maybe they did, but I'm pretty sure that they weren't thinking about whether I was learning or not, because there were 300 students waiting to take my spot at the University of Iowa if I decided to drop out. So, um, and, and I also have to tell you that the group of students that I teach, uh, they are different, certainly, from me. And God help us, if they were all like me, we were not going anywhere. So uh, I think the group of students that I teach, and I just wanted to address this to you, I think are the most exciting and interesting people I've ever met. Um, and uh, the law school to me, that was a shortcoming when I was in law school, was uh, this, that, that end of the semester exam. You know, you went to class, went every day, I knew every case, I could have recited anything. And I got to my first torts exam, my first exam in law school, and I'd never taken an exam. There were no practice exams. There was no formative assessment. There was nothing. I sat in there and I read the tort story of this poor woman. And I thought, man, she had a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't know what to do. You know, I read this story about this woman and I had no idea what to do. I had no idea. And I started to have a panic attack. And I went to the bathroom and I thought, I got to quit law school. Because <laughs> I'm in a flunk. And then, you know, the other part of my brain, my mother saying, you know, you don't quit anything. So I'm like, get your butt back in there and get it done. I didn't do well on that, by the way. <laughs> um, and uh, so my thought is, if I'm going to teach law school, I'm going to figure out how the students are different and how I can adapt. Like, how do I adapt my teaching to the students that I have for me? So that's, that's a long story to say that um, I first wanted to look at formative assessment because I didn't get any, and I knew that formative assessment is important. And I knew that that would have helped me in law school. And uh, another story, you'll have to forgive me on this story, but uh, my son does uh, moot court. He's, they have lawyer club at, the, at Sacagawea Junior High. I think that's the nerdiest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and he said, Mom, this is seventh grade last year. I'm going to do a lawyer club. I said, they a lawyer club? What do you guys do? <laughs> and so I, he, he had to, in this mock trial, he had to do a motion to dismiss. And it was a constitutional question. And I was like, seriously? So he said, Mom, I'm going to give my speech. And so he gives his speech. And it was pretty good. You know, he kind of underst understood the due process clause. But he said, dude. You're talking about the Fifth Amendment due process clause, not the 14th Amendment, and you got a state actor. Well, he looked at me like I was insane. But then we kind of went through and I gave him that formative assessment. We talked through it, I gave him some things to read. So I just have to, as a proud parent, I'm there, you know, you, you don't get to like sporting events where you get to like ding, 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 you know, like, and like get to stand up. You don't get to do that at mock trial. You know, you have to sit back there and go, yeah, that's my kid. But you don't get to go, yeah! <laughs> so he's doing his, uh, he had to do the response. And the kid before him, a little kid, you know, about this tall. And he gets up and he does this whole presentation on the Fifth Amendment. And my son stands up. And you just tell, he was just working around in his seat. And he stands up and he says, with all due respect, Your Honor, my uh, opposing counsel talked about the Fifth Amendment due process clause. It's not, we don't have a federal actor here, Your Honor, we have a state actor. And then he went on with his argument about state action, and uh, she said, you know, in mock trial, we're not supposed to give the dismissal to you, because then we wouldn't have the trial. <laughs> but she said, if I, if I was going to do it, I would give it to you. So it, to me, it, it showed the power, the absolute power of that formative assessment. That individual feedback that we're talking about it, she, uh, I, I forget your name. Co Professor Colker talked about in hers is that individual feedback, that ability to connect with your student and be able to give that feedback. So, 
So I thought, well, I have that individual experience, but what about the study? So there was a study that came out of the University of Illinois, and it was on middle school students, which you see, that's why I talked about my middle school, school students. Not because I just want to brag about them, but because most of the studies come out of K through 12 education, because they have been doing all of this stuff since, you know, before, since about when I was in grade school, so, which is a long time ago. And uh, they've been studying it. And they found, they did a study on middle school science students. And I'm sure you guys all did the uh, does it float experiment. You remember that from middle school? Like, does this float or doesn't it float? And what floats and why it floats? It's part of the curriculum, I understand. And, um, and they looked at whether a formative assessment helped the group as a whole in motivation and in learning. And, um, and to me, the results were extremely surprising that it actually doesn't significantly affect student motivation, which I thought was kind of surprising because I felt like, geez, I think it does. But they found that it didn't, and it didn't improve the overall performance of the group. But what do you think from the other presentations today? Here's the test. What do you, who do you think it helped? The low performing students. I don't know if I heard that, because you guys were like mumbling. You're worse than my students. Um, maybe that was an easy question. You know, if you ask an easy question, no one gives you the answer. Um, it, helped to, it helped to bridge that gap, because there's a widening gap between the high performing and the low performing. And formative assessment absolutely showed conclusively that it closed that gap. It helped to close that gap. And how, what was more interesting to me is how it closed the gap. How it closed the gap was making the students understand what it's like to be successful. What they have to do to be successful and how do they do it. It goes back to the story about how do you teach a kid how to play soccer? Do it better. God, I know. How do I do it better? So by giving them the tools to have real success. If they, if they have real success, they become better they have better conceptual ideas about education. So the study showed that they had those positive conceptual ideas about education. They become more task-oriented, learning-oriented students versus I just want to do better than the kids sitting next to me. And that single thing was the thing that they decided that formative assessment helped those lower performing students. They became less likely to lose their confidence if they didn't do well on an assessment, and they became uh, more likely to believe they could do it, which goes back to someone else's, uh, it was yours. <laughs> <laughs> I was just in my like, mind, I was thinking, because you had all the cool pictures on your PowerPoint, about the person you know, thinking, I can do this. Uh, that's self-efficacy. Informative as assessment shapes that self-efficacy. Um, by helping the students have more positive learning conceptualizations about themselves. I should note that when I gave this presentation to my faculty um, to help get some feedback from them, one of the faculty said, well, where on Bloom's taxonomy was this testing? Because he was postulating maybe it was testing on the bottom level Bloom's taxonomy, and therefore doesn't apply to law students. Because middle school students are not law students. I get that. So I went back and I looked at the study, and remarkably, they were testing synthesis, application, and evaluation, the top of the Bloom's taxonomy. So to, to say that just because it was middle school that they're not testing high-level learning is not true. Uh, they were actually testing absolute high-level learning. So where does this bring us? So we know that self is I see, I have a cool picture too, right? No, no cats, but, um, but I'm old, and, and that's good. So, my question is then, if formative assessment helps, when it all comes at the students at the same time, do students become whack-a-mole? You know, just get it done, hand it in. I don't care if I learn, I just need to get it done. Because it's due, and I have to get it done. Um, which is why, I only have three minutes? Oh my god. Boy, I talk <laughs> way too much. Okay, so, the question is, is can we do too much of a good thing? And the answer is absolutely yes. And there was a study uh, published in the Studies of Higher Education. If you're interested, I can give you the citation later. And it showed that as the greater number of assessments happen, this was a college level, 
um, the uh, students showed a remarkable decrease in positive thoughts about themselves and others, which is not very happy. Um, reduce a lower interest and enjoyment in life. They had lower perceived confidence. They had increased fear of failure. They have more depression, anger, frustration, confusion, and fatigue. And as you might well expect, that doesn't create good learning environments, <laughs> right? So, as you know, I like circle slides. So we'll go through my little circle slides really fast. But how can we avoid this by our students? How do we avoid this assessment fatigue by our students? Well, we live in a culture dominated by midterms and finals. And uh, they all happen at the same time. And so I've, I've handed out to you um, the Gonzaga's outcomes. And uh, you don't need to, uh, I, I gave them to you for your information. And then the second thing I gave you, which was I think the more important process in the process, is once you've got your outcomes and your competency is mapping your curriculum. We not only mapped our curriculum, but we also tried to determine where it was being assessed and by what methods were they being assessed. And so all professors filled it out. We actually had 100% that filled it out. If you think because I co-direct the institute that it's easy at Gonzaga, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, that rock, the one person pushing up and I'm, yeah, it's like that at Gonzaga too. And so what I'm gonna do with that data when I have it, we're just mapping the curriculum now, is once I figure out, don't give me the stop. I can't do it, not yet. Oh, I got one minute, okay, we're um, All right, I'm gonna ask some time to, uh, for, to conclude in a minute. Um, so once I know who's assessing what, and once I know where outcomes are being assessed, there's a couple of things the associate dean can do. One, the associate dean can say, why are we over-testing this outcome? Why are we assessing this outcome in every single class? And maybe we have to, but maybe we don't, and it's a conversation we have. So I'll have my first year professors get together and talk about what they're assessing, when they're assessing it, and how they're assessing it, to make sure that we have across the board assessment of our outcomes and not an over-assessment of those outcomes. Also, um, and that's for my one-off professors and my required courses. We also are going to engage in talking about having multiple low, don't put it up, I'm okay. <laughs> uh, multiple low stakes assessments throughout the semester. Therefore, they're not all ending up at the same time. And so my goal is to have a whole spreadsheet dated about when all the assessments are. There's some value to students having to take multiple assessments at the same time, but not every assessment for every class in the same week or in the same day, um, particularly for midterms. And so, my last slide, see, and then I'm done. Um, combating fatigue by the professor. I'll, I'll close by saying, we really only, if, we, if you go back to understanding, we, we assess what we value. We assess what we value. We don't have to assess everything. We assess what we value. And so when we value something, we can put the time in. And so my suggestion to professors when they say, I just can't do it anymore. <coughs> well, yeah, me neither. When I was asked to uh, chair some committee for my daughter's school, I'm like, do, do they meet between 12 and 5 a.m.? Because if they don't, <laughs> I don't have any time. And so I know what it's like to have fatigue. But the point is, is figure out what's important to you in your classroom, assess that. I use formative assessment for that. And lastly, cultivate that, eth that ethos of positive restlessness. When we are restless in what we do, we are continue to be motivated to do so. So anyway, thank you. Good, well we got that out of the way. I knew you guys wanted to clap for me as I walked across here. So I knew when my daughter asked me, so did they clap for you? I'll say yes, they did, right? So, I mean, really hard to be the pinch hitter here coming in right before lunch after these two women are very engaging. And so I hope I um, don't bore you to tears with this very enlightening um, presentation on the ABA assessment mandates and academic freedom. So. I have been talking about assessment for many, many years, and um, before 2014, when the new assessment mandates came out, 
I used to be kind of seen as the harbinger of evil. I would come in and talk to faculty and they'll go, it's never gonna happen. The ABA would never do that to us. And so I'd get all these dirty looks. And then when 2014 came around and I was like, and here's how you do it. So I became then the angel of mercy of telling people, look, I can save you from this. I can teach faculty how to do this. But regardless of the position that I was in when I would talk to faculty, the common thing that I heard refrain over and over again was, they can't make us do this, academic freedom. That white flag was raised every time. And so this is a little insight of can they make us do it, OK? Um, when we talk about, again, and I, I'm going back to Professor McGrath with his thing of spacing. So do you think it's been long enough that they've seen 314? One more time on 314, so we should know it by the end of today. These are the various assessment um, mandates that are in the new BA, ABA standards that were passed in 2014 and that may impact professors. So um, standard 301 talks about the objectives of a program of legal education and says that we must have established and publish our learning outcomes. Faculty are supposed to be involved in that, but more importantly, the guidance memo that came out from the ABA in 2015 said, and here in orange, learning outcomes for individual courses must be published in the course syllabi. I remember when I first told um, some of our professors, and at Dayton, same thing as at Gonzaga, um, she said, you know, the faculty that pushing up the hill, as I always say, people will go, God, you guys do great stuff at Dayton. I'll be like, yeah, there's two of us. And no, you know, the more faculty are on board, but really not that many. So, um, <laughs> you know, when I told some of the faculty members, you're gonna have to have the learning outcomes in your course syllabi, he said, well, I don't even have a syllabi. What do you mean? He goes, if someone asked me to give them a syllabi, I'm going to take the casebook that I wrote, go up to the copier, and photocopy the table of contents. That's my syllabi. So actually asking professors to put the learning outcomes in it um, has been somewhat of a challenge, but we're doing it. Um, the other things that will impact uh, faculty is 314, which we have talked about, having those formative assessments. Also, standard 404, which we don't talk about a lot, but it talks about the responsibilities of full-time professors. Embedded within that, it does say that a law school shall adopt, publish, and adhere to written policies about professional or professor's responsibilities, which include they must assess student performances in their classes and assess student learning at the law school. So they have to do it. In the ABA, ABA accreditation is saying we must do it. So then the question becomes, does that violate academic freedom? Here's where it gets really fun, right? Okay, so what is academic freedom? I thought that was an easy answer. Not so much. Um, the definition of academic freedom in and of itself is very murky. It's much more difficult. I just thought it was something like this. You know, I think we could all agree it sounds like it's a university professor's ability to investigate in their research, teach without external pressures or influence, right? Freedom to do that, that's why it's called freedom, right? Not so much. Um, when I went to find out what it actually means, again, the definition's unclear, and to who it actually belongs was even more unclear, which I found to be very interesting. So sources of academic freedom. Um, the American Association of University Professors back in 1950 articulated um, what we know to be academic freedom. What is that common knowledge of academic freedom? They also reiterated it in 1940. In a very quick summation, it comes down to three elements. It's the freedom of inquiry and research, the freedom to teach, and the freedom of extramural utterance and action. One thing that the AAUP was very um, explicit about was with these rights came correlative duties. Um, so that yes, you get these rights, professors, but you also have duties to teach. So it's already kind of embedded in the understanding of academic freedom that you still have to do certain things. Then, and this 1940 statement is many schools, universities, as well as law schools, higher education, have adopted that 1940 standard, that definition that I gave you before. It's in some faculty handbooks, it's actually in some employment contracts. What's really interesting, the ABA itself, in standard 405, talks about academic freedom, and it says they actually attach in the appendix the 1940 statement from the AAUP. So the ABA wants professors to have academic freedom. Then what happened? Of course, how it got really murky, courts got involved. Okay, and so then the court said, 
We think it comes from the United States Constitution. Many courts have cited the 1940 statement from the AAUP, but then the United States Supreme Court said, we think it comes from the Constitution. The Frankfurter concurrence is what a lot of people think of when they talk about academic freedom, and it's who may teach, what may be taught, how it should be taught, and who can be admitted to study. But the most interesting thing about this, it belongs to the university, not the professor. And that was a big shock when I saw that. It belongs to the university, not the individual professor. Well, what does that mean? Okay, what are the other problems with us rooting it in the United States Constitution? Are there any professors who work here? Mike, no? Yeah. It's a private school. It doesn't cover private schools. It doesn't cover you. It doesn't cover you and I. I work at a private school. We go back to your son would know this answer? Yeah. No there's no state actor, right? There's no state actor at a private school. I don't know school. if he could do that. Well, you know I, don't, I don't know if he's Mom, not and you're not that good of a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> so then the issue becomes, do these ABA assessment mandates impact academic freedom? as we've kind of defined it here, okay? So forget about all the state actor stuff. Yes, I think they do impact it. And like I said, from that very first slide that I talked about, professors are gonna have to have syllabi that have learning outcomes. That goes to that kind of what I have to teach my content. And then how it's taught. 314 as well as 404 talk about professors having the requirement to engage in formative assessment. Ouch, right? How would this arise? And really in my paper, what I'm gonna focus on, because I started writing this and it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and then I was like, bring it back. And so where I'm bringing it back to is going to be if an individual professor is suing his or her institution, because I don't wanna go down that rabbit hole of looking at whether accrediting agencies or state bodies and all of that stuff, because I think where it would come by is the professor being forced to engage in formative assessment by his institution, being forced to give a standardized test, or he or she openly criticizes assessment in their classroom. Dun, dun, dun. And what do I think will happen? I think it'll happen that I will have an error in my slide. I always like to point it out so nobody goes, do you see that error in her slide? There's an error in my slide. It's not Johnson versus Couric versus Abbott. It's supposed to be a husband there. Okay, so that's out of the way. But the, what will happen is the institution wins. It's called academic extension. In Grutter versus Bollinger in 2003, um, the U.S. Supreme Court kind of laid out this idea that when it comes to pedagogical decisions, we defer to the experts, the institution, not the individual faculty member. Here's just, and in my article I'll give many more examples from case law, but here's something from the Sixth Circuit as well as the First Circuit that talk about when it comes to what the university is requiring the professor to do, or the law school is requiring the professor to do in our case, the university's going to win. So here in the Sixth Circuit, you can't read, it's kind of small. Freedom of a university to decide what may be taught and how it should be taught, Frank Porter concurrence, right? Would be meaningless if a professor were entitled to refuse to comply with university requirements whenever they conflict with his or her teaching philosophy. Ouch, right? Um, Third Circuit, same kind of thing. We conclude that a public university professor does not have a First Amendment right to express via the school's grade assignment procedures. So they are saying that here, I can't tell you that you have to give students certain grades. You have your right to say no as a professor. I can come in as a university and give those grades myself though. So I'm not going to make, I'm not going to impinge upon your freedom to say that, but as the university, I've got to give the grade that I think is appropriate. So I don't think people would win if they try to bring an academic freedom claim against their university regardless. But again, I always like to leave on a high note. It's kind of that Sean Harper's anti-deficit model. Let's bring it up on a high note. So what can we do to make sure that we don't, as institutions, impinge upon faculty members' um, academic freedom rights? First, when it comes to that first standard 301 in the guidance memo about requiring professors to have learning outcomes, it's a shared responsibility in assessment. I joked when I said it was just my colleague and I doing assessment. When we sat down to write our learning outcomes, we surveyed all the faculty numerous times to say, look, you need to be involved. You are living and breathing this. We are not imposing these learning outcomes on you. We want everybody involved because at some point, you're gonna have to create some that are gonna go in your syllabus that are gonna have to somehow align 
back to the original institutional ones, we want to make sure that you have a voice. So really having faculty in at the ground level with shared responsibility. Then about how it's taught in the actual classroom. Foster innovation and experimentation. Avoid standardized assessment and clearly define expectations. So as an institution, if we're saying to faculty, hey, I want you to try this, do a year-long course you know, on one simulation. And what if you're, you know, your evaluations are horrible? As an institution, we need to back people up and say, you may fail a formative assessment, and that's okay, because failing is learning, but you're trying, you're trying to be innovative. And we're not telling you have to do it in a certain way, we're supporting you in your innovations. Please don't make faculty members give a standardized test, you know, that everybody must adopt this in their first year course. Give faculty the freedom. They know their content, they know their subject matter, and we are all learning to be better educators so while we're learning, let us experiment, let us try different things. And then clearly define the expectations. Um, you know, in our faculty uh, report back to the dean, you know, for the last several years, they have asked us specifically, what assessments are you doing in your classroom? So it's been a great thing. To, so we know that's coming again next year. Every faculty member knows. So you've got to have an idea of, these are my assessments. So at least there's not this surprise of, oh, you wanted me to do that? So set out clear expectations. I want you to try something, and I'm going to give you the freedom to do that. So I said I'd make it um, nice and short and sweet so that we would have time to do the rest of this. Do we have questions for the panel? Yes. Questions? Yes. Um, I was thinking about what folks were saying about the risk of too many formative assessments how you think about assessment with value. I'm wondering, thinking about the assessments that um, you know we encourage all of our doctrinal faculty to do an assessment of the course of the semester. And in, in my opinion, in that area, you, you are assessing the student's understanding of the doctrine in a particular course. And so if we agree that that's valuable, how do you avoid the problem of too many assessments because then you're now in a situation where all of the professors need to assess the students under understanding the doctrine in that course. I assume that question was for me. <laughs> well, I guess I was looking at it. So yeah, you know, well, and it was <laughs> it's my presentation. So, um, well, I think once we know from the document that I gave you, once we know who's assessing what and uh, what outcomes are being assessed, we can figure out. And then, and then I'm going to send around a timing document, which I don't have yet, um, and so that we can figure out the timing. And uh, so as we meet as all first year curriculum professors, we, I have a partial commitment from the first year curriculum to look at when they're going to do it. Because the midterm doesn't have to be midterm, right? It doesn't have to be the seventh week. It could be the fourth week. It, or you could do two. You could do one in the fourth and one in the eighth, and then then your, your summative assessment at the end. So the idea is to try to spread this out. Okay, so, and we do that at our law school. Within a section, people will talk about when they might not get the reason. And this would be not just the section, but the whole Across faculty, the you know, the whole curriculum, trying to get a document where people put in, here are the dates of my assessments, right. so that we can kind of see whether there's a that big bunch in the middle or whether we could spread those out a little bit. And then a related question was in that study you talked about of high school students and the negative effects. So it sounded like those were all in the positive psychology arena, or actually negative psychology, of, you know, lower self-efficacy and, and all of those issues. Were there also performance teachers' effects? Because I, that's where I see the difference between high schoolers and law students in terms of, you know, law students have to take a law exam and, you know, right. and whether they're happy about it. Right, exactly. That actually was a college um, study, okay. but it was done um, at the University of, of, of Illinois. And yes, they did talk about performance as well. And the performance goes down as they have more, which makes sense. If you have more assessments, you have less time to study, you can't get it together. And I, and I think there is an inherent balance and an inherent um, tension between <coughs> training our students to balance multiple things and then making it over too much. So, um, and I recognize that tension because everybody is balancing. And as a lawyer, you don't get to say, um, 
I already have a trial, and I'm sorry, I can't start one next week. You, you don't have that. So, I mean, there is that inherent tension, and, and I recognize that. That's part of, I didn't get to do that part of the presentation, but yes, there is an inherent tension, and I'm not, I don't have any great, uh, great solutions to that. Follow-up question? Oh, uh, yes, James, can I just ask a follow-up question? Yes. Um, <laughs> sorry. Like, where's James? Yes. Right over here. Uh, just, just, just a quick follow-up, not sure if I can So you're talking about very formalized formative assessment, but we, a lot of us do, like, right. constant formative assessment. Yeah. So I don't want to confuse that with the overwhelming effect, right? Correct. Like cash, right. I mean, the, the, the multiple choice test that you, or Perfect. question that you put up in the classroom, that's completely different. Right. I was just wondering if any of you had thought about the use of voluntary form of assessments to have to get more bang for your buck. So I understand your concept, Sandra, makes total sense, right? That if you just hear the whole assessment every day, but you just not be really prepared for them. And I remember um, my son's baby chemistry teacher had this what seemed like a nice policy, you could just retake quizzes as many times as you wanted. And then at some point, you know, he said to me, Mom, I can't keep going backwards, I have to go forwards, you know, and 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 I even with my voluntary practice exam, you know, when I have a student say, let's do a new question, I try to do a new question on a new topic. Because I don't want the student to keep going backwards to the first topic and they don't learn to mastery of the next topic. So so listening to all this and thinking about my own children's educational experiences and the law students I've taught over the last 32 years, I, I'm just wondering whether it might make more sense is, uh, instead of doing all this complicated mapping to say to a first year student, for example, you should do two form of assessments in the spring semester or in the fall semester. And, and, and you're going to have eight opportunities. You can do more than two. I mean, if they're not graded, of course, that, that would be nice, I think, because I think ungraded exercises do have anxiety issues, and more learning can take place. But, but so I just think that this math problem would really be complicated if everybody's doing them all the time. And so we'll have people thought about making more of these exercises voluntary, but maybe have a requirement for a certain number so that students can be, like one of the things I don't like about when people just take studies from middle school and high school and college and they transfer them to law students, law students are very mature learners. They've had a lot of success academically. And I don't want to insult them by denying that previous, previous, previous good experience they've had, they're very high in the right GPA, but they go to law school. Um, and so that's another reason why I think it's more respectful for us maybe sometimes not put out more and more and more on them, but to say, look at your semester. That's what you have to do as a lawyer. And it's self-plan when you want to do these things in light of the struggles you might be having in your particular course. So response lot. I'm writing that down. <laughs> so I think that's a great idea. And and there's a um, there's a recognized lack of studies in the law school environment. Mm -hmm. it's all the studies we base everything on is grade school, middle school, high school, and college. With college being just in the last few years. So, but I think that's an excellent idea. And if I could just add one thing, I, I always want to make sure when we talk about formative assessment, they don't have to be high stakes formative assessments. So they don't all have to be graded, but they can do even be classroom exercises where students still learn a lot. It takes some time out of maybe the coverage in that class but it can still be some type of formative assessment that doesn't have to be so high stakes. I, I know at Dayton we have, we just passed this thing that we require all first year professors to have three formative assessments in every every first year class within the first eight weeks of class. Now how we got that passed, I'm not sure, but we did. And the professors realized, I didn't mean three quizzes, I didn't mean three midterms. There's gotta be something that the students are doing so that you have an idea, and that goes to that early alert system that we spoke about earlier today of, wait, are these, are these students in, you know, having problems here in their first year that we need to be focused on? But again, it's just the idea. Formative doesn't have to be huge, high stakes. Right? Can I add something to that? Um, it's also true that you know, when we think about high stakes formative assessment, there would be scholars who would say that's a contradiction in terms. Exactly. 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 You know? And in fact, it's very possible that students do not attend to feedback when they get a grade, and they don't even look at it. And we've done all this copious work on these examinations, and they don't care. But if they didn't get a grade, and have some other motivations, this stuff is tough, they're more likely to look at it. So I just want to put that out there. Oh, so then, um, Brez, the, the, I saw the image of you conversing with another professor. Academic freedom, the, the pushback effect. And I don't know if we've talked about that a lot. And I'm wondering, do you think it's more effective to 
just got to talk to the faculty about how formative assessment, summative assessment, the program learning outcomes are better teaching, better education, rather than the ABA is making us do it. Absolutely. And how do you how do you do that? Is is my next question. When when I go out and I talk to faculty, I always start with the room of we're all sitting here and we have one thing in common. We're all educators, and as educators, what we want to to have, we want our students to learn. So now that we have that out of the way, we all want to do that. There is some evidence that shows that assessment helps our students become better learners. So don't do it to get the check mark for the ABA. I really don't care. Do it because I care with that student right there. That's what I get paid to do is make sure that student's the best student that he or she can be and learn something out of my class. So it's really, I try to step away from that get your check mark from the ABA because everybody, you know, when we started having those discussions about our faculty had to have three formative assessments, you know, it was just like a student. How low can I go? How can I gain this system? What's going to count? You know, how many words do I have to grade? And, you know, so it was don't do it for that purpose. Don't do it for that. Do it for the ultimate purpose, which is to improve our students' learning. So that's where I try to come at. That's the tactic. Well, if I can follow up on that, um, most of the studies show you really only need one and maybe two um, substantive formative feedback in one semester to really affect student learning. So you don't need a lot, you just need one solid piece of formative assessment for them. And I, when I talk to my faculty, I always go back to we monitor what we value, we assess what we value, and if you value the learning and you value improving the learning, that's what we're doing. Um, but it sounds easier than it is. <laughs> and I recognize that academic freedom is the thing that comes up most often when I'm talking to faculty. So I can't wait to read your article so I have some power to say that after, after April 19th. <laughs> That's when all of our papers are due. <laughs> I'm just going to bring one study to your attention. There was a 1981 study by Carrie Nagan, and what she actually found that cumulatively, the more opportunities for formative feedback continue to have a more positive effect. Um, and his study was from a law school environment, the very few studies from a law school environment is from 1981, it's a little bit older study, no study is perfect. But um, I think it does, you know, in my study, our students all had had all sorts of other opportunities for formative feedback that were part of our study, but yet we found the additional decision by the student, of course, was voluntary right to do my form of assessment did have a positive effect on their learning, but it would be unfair to say that that was their only formative opportunity that year, but that is just not the case. We require a midterm and fall, and we do all these other things at my law school as to other law schools. So I, I, I certainly think the idea of student feedback, I mean, student fatigue, is, it makes sense. I, I, I can imagine that's true. I'm not sure that there's data from the law school environment showing that we're at that point yet, but, but we can document that. this morning that formative assessment helps the higher end students more and I think I've heard that this morning that formative assessment helps the lower end students more. So I'm I think it depends, honestly, I think it depends on the type of formative assessment you're using. I think I um, I think Dr. Uh, no. Oh, well, thank you. I can only see the N-O, so. I knew it wasn't Dr. No, which would be cool if it was. Um, I believe when he was talking about the, the metacognition type formative feedback, when you have um, a rubric and you have a sample answer, that tends to work better in the upper levels. The one where you have, you call it tutor, I assume you're called the tutor. Yeah. Uh, the professor feedback or the upper division student feedback, that tends to help the, the lower um, performing students. So I mean, I think it depends on the type of feedback, the, the, the type of assessment that you're giving. Does that help? That helps. Okay. Any other questions for our panel? <laughs> Well, are we done uh, with our questions? Yes, well, let's thank the panelists yeah. again then. And sure.
Alright, so we're going to break for lunch in the atrium downstairs and we will start up here at 1 o'clock.